And I'm very happy to introduce our speaker today. Our speaker is Steve Shirer from Carleton College, and he will talk about relative topological complexity and configuration spaces. Take it away, Steve. All right, well, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen with you right now. So yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about relative topological complexity and configuration spaces. And this is joint work with Brian Benke and Xu Hong Shui. So to get started, just to give you a little bit of an overview of what we're gonna be talking about today. When we're talking about the topological complexity of configuration spaces, Loosely speaking, this is a integer, which is one less than the minimum number of continuous rules that you need how to describe uh, to how to move between any two configurations of n points in your space y. So you can have this sort of picture in mind. Uh, let's say that this space here is y, so it's a space that just looks like the letter y. Um, so what we're trying to do, let's say we have three robots and we want to move them from a configuration where we have y1, y2, y3 to a second configuration where we have y1 prime, y2 prime, and y3 prime. So, I mean, you can think about this for a little bit, but one way that you can do that here is you can kind of first move y2 out of the way a little bit and then allow y1 to move over to y1 prime. And then I guess we can move y2 to y2 prime and then finally move y3 to y3 prime. So it turns out that you can describe how to move between any two of these configurations using three rules, but you can't do it with any fewer. So this uh, topological complexity of three points in this kind of letter Y graph is equal to two. That's a follows from a result of Farber from a couple of years ago. So that leads us into kind of our motivation uh, for the talk. And that is the following question. Let's say we place the, the space Y in some larger space Y prime, and we want to still look for rules for how to uh, move between configurations of n points in y, but during the motion we can go into the larger space y prime. The question is, can we get away with using fewer rules than what we would need if we're requiring to stay in y? So here's kind of a picture of what that might look like. We have that same space y here, but we've placed it in this larger space. So we are still kind of starting and ending with configurations of, in this case, three points on this letter Y kind of on the ground floor. But in getting from one configuration to the next, we're allowing ourselves to move up and down. And it's not too hard to convince yourself that if this is the type of motion that you're allowing, you can get away with just using one rule. So we're gonna be talking about this kind of relative topological complexity here, where the notation here is saying that we're starting and ending with configurations of three points in Y. But in getting from one configuration to the next, we're allowed to move into the larger space y prime. So that's kind of our motivation here. We're again starting and ending with configurations of points in y, but we have kind of some bigger space where we're allowed to move in getting from one configuration to the next. So what I have next is just a short little outline of what we're going to be talking about during the talk. So we'll so in the first couple of minutes, just going over the uh, definitions of these kind of relative topological complexities and some general results about relative TC. And those are gonna be kind of like direct analogs of the standard TC results. And then once we have that kind of background information, we're gonna shift gears and talk about uh, configuration spaces in the context of this relative topological complexity. So we'll get started with some basic observations and examples, and then the main kind of object that we're going to be interested in is this TC, which is kind of like the picture that I showed you before. So again, we're going to be starting and ending with configurations of n points in some space y. But in getting from one configuration to the next, we're going to allow ourselves to move throughout y times i. So you can imagine that you kind of have y on the ground floor, and then in getting from one configuration to the next, we're allowing ourselves to move up and down. So the main result that we're going to have about this kind of relative TC is that it's bounded above by the TC of Y to the N and bounded below in some cases by TC of Y. So that'll be kind of the main result. And then if we have time at the end, we'll talk through some um, specific examples. Okay, so to get started, we'll just quickly review the definition of the standard topological complexity. So if we have a space X, as usual, we're going to let PX be the space of all paths in X, and that gives us this path uh, space vibration, which just sends a path sigma to its two endpoints, and that leads us into Farber's definition of TC. So the topological complexity of X is the smallest integer case such that we can cover all of X cross X with K plus one open sets 
U0 prime up through UK prime, such that we can find sections of this vibration over each of those open sets. And then if you can't do that, then the TC is infinite. So that's the, the definition of topological complexity that we all know and love. And then the definition of relative TC is basically the same idea. The only difference is what we're going to do here is instead of looking at all of X cross X, we're going to start with the subset of X cross X. So you can think about this as being the set of all like desirable pairs of initial and final points. And then we have this path space here, which is the set of all paths in X, which start and end with um, points which form a pair in A. And then we get the same kind of vibration where we just send a path sigma to its two endpoints. And then we have a completely analogous definition of this relative topological complexity. It's the smallest integer k such that we can cover um, A now with k plus one open sets u0 through uk such that we get continuous sections over each of those um, open sets. And then as usual, if we can't do that, we'll let the TC be infinite. So one quick thing that I would like to point out about this is that you can realize this um, vibration, which gives you the relative TC as the pullback of the kind of standard TC vibration under the inclusion of A into X cross X. So you have this picture here, here's a vibration for the standard TC. If you pull that back under the inclusion, you get the vibration for this relative TC. Okay, so, so this relative TC is defined for any uh, subset of X cross X, but we're gonna be focusing on the case in which uh, the subset A is of the form Y1 cross Y2 for subsets Y1 and Y2 of X. So what we're doing then is when we're studying this relative TC of Y1 cross Y2 sort of inside of X, we're interested in finding paths which start at points in Y1 and at points in Y2, but the path can go anywhere throughout X. So I have just a couple of quick notes about this specific um, case of relative topological complexity. So if we're in the situation in which the two subsets Y1 and Y2 are the same, so we can just call it Y, then this relative TC agrees with the topological com complexity of the inclusion map um, as defined by Murillo and Wu and then later Scott. So that's the first comment here. There's this relationship between relative TC and the uh, topological complexity of a map. And the second point is that the um, if you're in a case in which y1 is all of x and y2 is just some subset y of x, then this relative TC here agrees with uh, Bob Short's definition of the to uh, relative topological complexity of the pair xy. So with those initial kind of notes out of the way, we can start to get some like real simple, almost obvious bounds on this relative topological complexity. So the first one is, this relative topological complexity of Y1 cross Y2 inside of X, that's gonna be bounded above by the topological complexity of X. And that's even true. I mean, that's not just true for Y1 cross Y2. You can have any subset A of um, X cross X here and that relative TC is gonna be bounded above by X. And intuitively that's coming from the fact that in this topological complexity, we have fewer pairs in, of initial final configurations than we do here. So that's what could potentially make this smaller than this. So on the other hand, now we also have this upper bound that says that this uh, relative TC again is bounded above by the TC of the union of Y1 and Y2. Um, and in particular, if you're again in this case where the Y1 and the Y2 are the same, then we get that the TC of Y cross Y inside of X is bounded above by the TC of Y. And like the intuition there is that in this TC here, we have a, a kind of, we have more choices of paths. So because you have more possible paths between points in Y, um, that could again kind of make this TC potentially smaller. Okay, so what I would like to do next is talk about the kind of standard results about regular topological complexity, and then think about how we can translate those into this relative context. So here are the like the four main standard topological complexity results that I want to talk about. Uh, so just quickly going through these, the first one tells us that the topological complexity of X is zero if and only if the space X is contractible. So this like classifies when you have trivial TC. Next, we have the homotopy invariance of topological complexity, which tells us if we have homotopy equivalent spaces, they have the same topological complexity. Then we have this standard upper bound based on kind of dimensionality thing. So if we have an n-dimensional CW complex X, which is M connected, then the TC is bounded above by twice the dimension plus one divided by the connectivity plus one. And then we have this uh, traditional 
lower bound based on cohomology, which tells us if we can find these K classes in the kernel of the cut product um, of X, such that if you multiply those classes together in the tensor product, you get something non-trivial, then the TC is at least K. So like I said, those are kind of the standard TC results that we all know. And what I wanna think about next for a little bit is how can we translate these into this relative context? So here is kind of the relative analogs of those standard TC results. The first one kind of classifies when this relative TC is equal to zero. And this happens if and only if the inclusions of Y1 and Y2 into X are both null homotopic. So that's the analog of the first one. Now, the, the second previous statement was this kind of homotopic invariance of topological complexity. So it's a little bit more subtle with the relative topological complexity. So the idea here is if we have two different spaces, X and X prime, and each of those have subspaces, so we'll have Y1 and Y2 inside of X and Y1 prime and Y2 prime inside of X prime, we want to get like some kind of a homotopy type relationship between those different spaces, which is going to guarantee that these two topological complexities are the same. And I mean, it's, it's not too hard to convince yourself that it's not enough to just say that X and X prime are homotopy equivalent and then the, the Y's are, course, are homotopy equivalent to the corresponding Y primes because it depends on how the Y's are kind of embedded in the X's. So instead, what you can do is you can say that if you have a bunch of different maps, so if we have a map F going from X to X prime, a map F prime from X prime to X, uh, maps alpha, um, so alpha one going from Y one to Y one prime and uh, alpha two from Y two to Y two prime and then going the other way, alpha one prime from Y one prime to Y one and uh, alpha two prime from Y two prime to Y two, such that all of these map fits into these homotopy commutative diagrams, then that guarantees that these two topological complexities are the same. So I'll say a bit more about that in a few moments, but what I wanna just quickly go through next are the, uh, the lower bounds and upper bounds um, in properties three and four. So with, Property three, this is saying if we have an M dimensional, or excuse me, an M connected CW complex X with subcomplexes Y1 and Y2, which have dimensions N1 and N2 respectively, then this relative TC is bounded above by the sum of the dimensions of the subcomplexes plus one divided by the connectivity of X plus one. So you can see how that's like analogous to the results from before. But one thing that I can point out about this is if you have like a highly connected space X, and the subcomplexes have relatively small dimensions, then this fraction here could be less than one. So you get kind of like easy examples where this relative TC is trivial just based on this here, because if it's less than one, then it has to be zero. But anyway, that's this kind of version of upper bounds based on dimensionality things. And then the last property here is the lower bound based on the cohomology. And this starts out almost the exact same way. We're gonna look for K classes in the kernel of the cup product of X. But instead of just requiring that this product here is non-zero in the tensor of the cohomology of X, we're going to require that it's non-zero if we apply the map induced by the, um, by the inclusions. So these are the analogs of the standard TC results in the context of relative TC. So just a couple of notes about these. Uh, so this first result about when the relative TC is zero, it, it said that it's, it's zero if and only if the inclusions of Y1 and Y2 into X are both in the whole topic. It's not too hard to see that that property is equivalent to saying that the projections of Y1 cross Y2 onto Y1 and of Y1 cross Y2 onto Y2 are those two projections are homotopic. And in fact, um, Farber points out that um, like that, that property kind of classifies the cases of, of when this TC is equal to zero in the, in the more general context where A can be anything. So this TC is zero if and only if the two projections of A onto X are um, homotopic. So really that first result from the previous slide is just kind of a special case of this result. And then the uh, third and fourth property, which were the ones on the, about the upper and lower bounds, you can prove those using pretty much the exact same arguments as you do in the standard topological complexity context. So really the only thing here that has a little bit to say anything about is that second property about this kind of version of homotopy equivalence. So what I would like to do is just spend a couple of moments talking about the proof of this kind of homotopy invariance of the relative topological comp complexity. So let me quickly go back to just look at the statement of that result. So the idea is, again, we have two spaces X and X prime, and we have two subspaces um, of each of those. So we have Y1 and Y2 inside of X and then Y1 prime and Y2 prime inside of X prime. And we get these maps that fit in these, these commutative diagrams. 
So we want to think about how can we use those maps to um, see that these two TCs are actually equal. So I'll sketch Please. a proof. Yes, go ahead. Excuse me. Um, can I ask? Um, so there is no no assumption on the composite of f and f prime. That's correct. Yeah. So like the f and the f prime don't have to be like homotopy equivalents or anything. Okay. So very very very. I think you, you cut out. Excuse me, yes. So you, there is no, there are not homotopy equivalents, F and F prime. Yeah, that's correct. So the, the F okay. and the F prime don't have to be homotopy equivalences. Okay, yes. thanks. Yep. Um, right, so we'll, we'll kind of talk through the, the proof here. So let's say that we know what the, um, like what the TC is for the prime spaces. So we kind of have motion planning algorithms over here. So we have, Again, we have x, we have y1 and uh, y, y1 prime and y2 prime inside of x prime, and we have a motion planning algorithm here. So let's say that we know the TC is equal to k, so we can find these open sets and these sections to give us a TC over here, and we want to use those to get motion planning algorithms over here. And the diagram that we're going to need for this one is this diagram here. So I guess the first thing we need to do is we need to get an open cover of y1 cross y2. Now we can do that easily by just um, looking at the inverse image of the, the UI prime under alpha one cross alpha two. So if we do that, then we get this open cover of Y one cross Y two by these sets UI, which are just the inverse images of the, the UI, prize, UI primes under alpha one cross alpha two. So what we need to do now is we need to describe what the sections look like um, over these open sets. So if we pick a point Y one, Y two in UI, then if we look at these points over here, so if we apply alpha one to y one and alpha two to y two, by this construction, that's going to give us a point in the ui prime. So then what we have is we have a, a path si prime of y one prime y prime or y two prime, which is a path between those two points over here in x. And we want to kind of send that back to a path in, or excuse me, in, in x prime. We want to send that back to a path in x. And we can do that just by applying f prime. And if we're lucky, That'll send that'll send um, alpha one of y one to y one and alpha two of y two to y two, but that doesn't necessarily have to happen. So, like, what we need to do now is we need to get a path from y one to um, alpha one of y one, and then a path from alpha two of y two to y two, and that's where we're going to we're going to use this homotopy commutative diagram. If we stare that at that for a second, this gives us a path from uh, from y one to f prime of alpha one of y one, and then conversely from um, f prime of alpha two of y two to y two. So we get all these different pieces here. We get the, the map from y one to um, f prime of alpha one of y one, the path here, and then the path from um, f prime of alpha two of y two to y two. So if you put all those pieces together, then this gives us a path from y one to y two. And then if you move the y one, y two around a little bit in the UI, the paths are going to vary continuously. So you get a continuous section over the UI, and then you can do that for each of the UIs. So then that tells us that this TC here is less than or equal to K. And then by a completely symmetric argument using like the other commutative diagram, you can see that um, you get the reverse inequality. So that's kind of the version of, of this um, homotopy invariance that works in the context of relative topological complexity. Okay, so with that being said, what I would like to do now is kind of switch gears and talk about configuration spaces. So I'm going to be dealing with just the ordered configuration spaces for the rest of the talk. So I'm going to denote that configuration space by CN of X. So you can think about this just as just being the set of all n tuples of points in X where you can't have the same point in two different components. So I always think about this as being like n different robots which are moving throughout X and you're just not allowed to have the robots collide. So then back to this kind of motivating question that we had earlier the question was if we start with the space y can we put that inside of a larger space and look for continuous rules that tell us how to move between configurations of endpoints in y if we're allowed to go into the larger space throughout that motion if that's the case can we use fewer rules than if we're required to stay in y so in terms of topological complexity what this is asking is can we find a space y prime such that this relative TC, which is where we're allowed to move throughout the larger space Y prime, is less than the regular TC where we are required to stay in Y. And 
there's a very easy answer to this. You can always make it work out so that this relative TC is equal to zero. Um, so you can, you can always find an appropriate Y prime to make this relative TC zero. One way that you can do that is you can take the join of Y with a, a discrete space with N points. So that's kind of what this picture looks like here. You can imagine that this is Y, this kind of circle on the bottom. And then if we want to join that with three points, you get something like this. And that really just amounts to saying that we kind of have three copies of the cone on Y glued over or along, the, uh, along Y itself. So then if we want to get from a configuration of three points in Y, so we want to get from Y1, Y2, Y3 to a different configuration, Y1 prime, Y2 prime, Y3 prime, the idea is you kind of have like a separate cone for each robot. So to get from Y1 to Y1 prime, you can just go from Y1 up to the first cone point down to Y1 prime, and then to get from Y2 to Y2 prime, same thing, go to the second cone point, and then same thing for Y3. So you can see there that we get this kind of continuous choice of paths between any two configurations um, so that this TC is going to be trivial. And then you might also ask yourself, what if, what if we want to allow for like these Y's here to be different? So maybe you have like one set of kind of desirable initial configurations and then a second set of desirable final configurations. You can do the same thing. So instead of just looking at the join of, of Y with um, this discrete space with endpoints, you can look at the join of the union of the two spaces with a discrete space with, uh, discrete space with endpoints. And then again, you get that this relative TC is going to be zero. Okay. Well, that's great, but the kind of issue with that is, well, maybe you don't really have control about what this larger space is. Maybe you, maybe you don't want to deal with this join of Y with this discrete space. So the question is, if we can't choose what Y prime is, if we already know what Y prime is, how can we kind of get some idea of what's happening with this relative TC? So that's what we're going to be focusing on for the remainder of the talk. We're going to focus on this case in which the, the kind of larger space is just a product of the kind of underlying space with a, a unit interval. So that contains um, the, the underlying space as the subspace where like the kind of second component is just zero. So again, the kind of idea is you have like Y on the ground and then you're allowing yourself to go up and down. So then when we're studying this relative topological complexity, what we're trying to get at is paths, which like I keep saying, start and end at points in, at, at configurations in Y, but where the robots can move up and down. So like I kind of think about this as like the robots are drones now where they can move up and down, but they have to stay like directly above Y. So um, here's a picture for that same kind of picture from before. You're starting and ending on the ground, but you can move up and down throughout the motion. Okay, so that leads us into kind of the, our main result. So the main result is if we have two different spaces, Y1 and Y2, and we let Y denote their union, then with certain hypotheses, uh, we have this inequality. So this kind of middle thing here, that's like the main object that we're interested in. This is kind of the, the TC that we want to study. Now we can show that it's bounded above by this relative TC and bounded below by this relative TC in certain situations. And as a kind of specific case of that, if the Y1 and the Y2 are the same, then we have again kind of the TC that we want to study in the middle here. And we're saying that it's bounded above by the TC of Y to the N and bounded below by just the TC of Y. So what I'm going to do for the next few minutes is talk through the, uh, the intuition behind the proofs of these two uh, bounds, so the upper bound over here and the lower bound here. And we'll start with the upper bound because that one's a little bit easier. Um, but I will say for the remainder of the talk, whenever we have two spaces, Y1 and Y2, I'm going to denote their union by Y. OK, so starting with the upper bound again the upper bound says that if we are looking to study this topological complexity where we're starting with configurations of endpoints in y ending with configurations of endpoints in y2 but the robots can move up and down throughout the motion that's bounded above by the tc of, of y1 to the nth power times y2 to the nth power where we're allowed to move in y to the n which is the, the, the union of y1 and y2 so Here's the sketch of the proof here. We're going to be using that kind of version of homotopy invariance that I mentioned earlier. So we can look at a map that goes from the configuration space of Y cross I into Y to the N, where we take a configuration like this. So like a configuration here has two components, right? It has like a Y component and it has an I component. And we're basically just going to forget about the I component. So we take a configuration here and just send it to the, the kind of Y stuff. So the picture, that's kind of what's happening here. If we start with this configuration, just ignore the heights, and we get a, a, a collection of endpoints over here in, um, in Y. And now, I mean, it's possible that you start with a configuration here, 
and you end up over here with something which isn't a configuration, but that's okay. We're not worried about that. Um, so we have a map going that way, and then we have a map going the other way, where if we start with a collection of endpoints over here, we can get a configuration over here by just lifting the nth robot up to height one over n. So we're lifting y1 up to height one, lifting y2 to height a half, lifting y3 to height a third, and so on. So with this, then we can consider the following diagrams. So here we have the configuration spaces of the, uh, the subspaces y1 and y2, and then we have this map that we just described. And then same thing over here, we have the configuration spaces of y1 and y2 and the map that we described here. So looking at the diagram on the left, if we start with a configuration of endpoints in yj and then don't do anything to it, and then include it into a configuration of endpoints in y cross i, and then do this kind of projection down, we're going to end up exactly where we started. So in other words, this diagram here strictly commutes. Now, on the other hand, if we start with a configuration here, don't do anything to it, include it into y to the n, what this map is doing, that's lifting up the robots to different heights. So this here doesn't strictly commute, but it's easy to convince yourself that it does homotopy commute. So we have these two um, diagrams here, which are homotopy commutative. So then that result that I mentioned earlier about the kind of homotopy invariance of the relative TC tells us that this relative TC, which is the one that we're trying to study, is equal to this relative TC. And intuitively, what this is saying is if you're starting with configurations of endpoints in Y1 and ending with configurations of endpoints in Y2, and you don't allow the robots to collide, but you allow them to move up and down, that's somehow equivalent to starting with those same configurations and allowing them to collide throughout the motion. But that basically does it now, because now we can just observe that since this configuration space is a subspace of this, and this relative TC like works well with subspaces, um, this TC here is less than this TC. And that's what we were trying to show. We were trying to show that this thing that we're trying to study is less than this. And again, kind of as a special case of this, if the Y1 and the Y2 are the same, then this over here is just the TC of Y to the N. Okay, so that gives us the upper bounds. Now, the lower bounds are, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start by just considering the case where we do have uh, Y1 and Y2 being the same. So the lower bounds here are saying that the, this TC that we're trying to study is bounded below by the TC of Y. And at first, I mean, that seems like that's kind of like an intuitive thing, right? Because over here, we're trying to talk about how to move between configurations of endpoints in Y. And here we're talking about how to move between just like from one point in Y to another point. So it seems like this should be easier, but I'm gonna to try to convince you that actually showing that that is the case is a little bit more subtle than it might seem at first. So, the, the kind of way that you would think to prove this is if you know what this TC is here, can you somehow use like your motion planning algorithm for that TC to get a TC for just Y or to get a motion planning algorithm for just Y? So like here's kind of the maybe a naive idea for a proof of how you might think to do this. So again, what we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how to move from Y to Y prime in Y, but all we know how to do is how to move between configurations. So you have to somehow associate a configuration to Y and associate a configuration to Y prime. And what you might try at first is why don't we just pick like N minus one fixed points in Y, which are all different, and we can kind of use those to fill in configurations. So you think, okay, we have a configuration here, which is kind of associated to Y. We have a configuration here, which is associated to Y prime. So then our motion planning algorithm for this TC, that tells us how to move from, uh, from this configuration to this configuration. And all we want to do is we just want to move from Y to Y prime. And we kind of have more than that, right? We know how to move from this configuration Y, Y2, Y3 to a second configuration Y1, Y2, Y3, or Y prime, Y2, Y3. And I mean, that motion is happening in Y cross I. But what you can do is you can just look at kind of the piece of that corresponding to like the first component that gives you a path in Y cross I from Y to Y prime. And then just like project that down to kind of the ground level that gives you a path then from Y to Y prime like this. So in this case here, I mean, that does, that tells you how to move from Y to Y prime in Y using the motion planning algorithm for this TC. But you can kind of see the issue here. This wouldn't tell us, I mean, if we're gonna be using the same like Y2, Y3 and so on for all the different Ys, that's not gonna tell us, for example, how to move from Y2 to Y prime. So that's kind of the issue here. This doesn't have it. This doesn't. This idea doesn't tell us how to move from Y to Y prime if either one of those points happens to be one of the 
these kind of n minus one fixed points that we chose to fill in the, the, the configuration. So what you might think then was, well, if I want to, if I want to use this, this kind of idea to get from y to y, or if I want to use this idea to get from y2 to y prime, why don't we just look at a point that's real close to y2, that this will give us a path from this point over to y prime, and maybe we can just like take a limit and hope that this, the path kind of converges from a, to a path from y2 to y prime. But I'm going to try to convince you that you can't always do that continuously. So I'm going to do that through an example where I'm going to be looking at this relative TC here, where we're starting and ending with configurations of two points on the real line. But as usual, in getting from one configuration to the next, we're allowing ourselves to move up and down. So if we're going to be talking about this TC, what we have to do is we have to describe how to move from a configuration like this to a configuration like this. So we have configuration of two points in R, another configuration of two points in R. We want to describe how to get from one to the next. So I'm going to do that using like two different cases, depending on how the uh, the two components of the first configuration are related. So if the first component of the first configuration is less than the second, the way that we're going to move from y1 to y1 prime is by just going up to some height, going over to the point directly above one, going over to the point directly above y1 prime, and then back down. So that tells us kind of how to move the first robot. And then for the second robot, all we're going to do is just kind of go on the you know, do like the obvious thing, just take the kind of shortest path from y2 to y2 prime. So that's what we're going to do if the first component of the first configuration is less than the second component. But then if the first component is greater than the second component, we're going to do something kind of opposite. We're going to go from y1 up to some point and then over to the point directly above negative one. And then from there to the point directly above y1 prime and then down. And then same thing for the y2. So even though this is kind of a strange way to move between configurations of points of, of two points in R, this covers all the different configurations, right? So this, this, this is like a valid motion planning algorithm um, for, for this TC here. And it tells us then that that TC is equal to zero. I and mean, we've covered every single possible configuration with the, this, this one kind of rule here. So the question then is, can we use this motion planning algorithm for this TC to get the TC of R? And I mean, I know we all know that the TC of R is equal to zero, but the question is, can we see that using this motion planning algorithm? So getting back to what I was suggesting earlier, if we're trying to use this strange motion planning algorithm for configurations to tell you just how to move between points in R, if we want to get from Y to Y prime in R, and we do like I suggested earlier, just kind of pick some fixed point Y2 that are, as long as, um, as long as the y1 and then y1, or yeah, the y and the y prime aren't equal to y2, then this motion planning algorithm gives us a path between these two configurations. Then we can do, like I suggested, we can kind of just project the first component of that path down to r to get a path from, uh, from y to y prime. Um, and that's great. That works as long as the y and the y prime aren't equal to y2. But like I was saying, the issue is that you don't know what to do if you're exactly at y2. So like, for example, here, we don't know how to move from y2 to y prime. And you can see that like there's no way that you can make a continuous choice of a path from y2 to y prime, because if you move y2 a little bit to the left, you're going to be doing this stupid thing where you go over here and then to y prime. And, but if you move y2 to the right a little bit, then you're going to be doing this thing. So in other words, like there's no way that you can fill this in. You, can, you can't extend this to a continuous section, which is defined over all of r across r. So. I mean, kind of the issue here is that because we're picking the same point to fill in the configurations, regardless of what the y and the y prime are, we're like missing some configurations. So then you, what you can do instead is you can fill in configurations using points which depend on y and y prime. So one way that you can do that is just fill in the configurations by just kind of moving one point over. So instead of going from y, y2 to y prime, y2, we're going to go from y, y plus one to y prime, y prime plus one. And you see the issue, the, the thing with that now is we're not missing any configurations for any point in R, we get a kind of, we get a configuration here. So then we can do just like we said before, we can just look at kind of the first path or the first part of the path between those two configurations and just project it down. And like, you don't have this issue now of kind of on one half you're doing this one direction and on the other half you're doing the other direction because the, the second component here is always gonna be greater than the first. So, Right, so the idea with this is with this way to fill in these configurations, we do actually get a pair of configurations for each pair of points in R, and then we can do just like we suggested, pick out the path between those configurations, 
look at the first component, which is a path from R, or excuse me, from Y to Y prime in R cross I, and then just project that down to get a path from Y to Y prime in R. So that's kind of the, the motivation behind this next result here. Um, it's kind of like an extension of that. So the idea is if we are, if we have the, the two subspaces Y1 and Y2, and if we can find N minus one fixed point free maps for each of those subspaces, we can use those fixed point free maps to kind of fill in the configurations. So that's kind of the idea here. If, if we can find these N minus one fixed point free maps, um, Fij going from yj to yj for um, i equals one through n minus one, such that those maps um, act differently on y for different values of kind of like the first component there. So if i is not equal to j, or if i is not equal to k rather, then these two um, functions act differently on y, then we get this lower bound on tc. And again, the kind of idea with this is if we if we know what this tc is, and we want to use that to get a motion planning algorithm over here, we can look at the motion planning algorithm for the TC that we know about. And then if we want to get a path from Y to Y prime, um, kind of like for this TC, just fill in the configurations using those fixed point free maps. And then those give you, um, if you look at the first component, then that's going to give you a path from Y to Y prime in um, Y cross I. And then, like I said before, just kind of project it down. So, that's kind of the main idea there. That's our, our first result um, that we get this lower bound on, on this relative TC based on this relative TC. And again, if you're in the case where the Y1 and the Y2 are the same, then this is saying that this TC here is greater than the TC of Y. Okay, so that's one way to kind of get around this issue of trying to fill in the configurations. Another way is to um, basically start with your space Y and kind of blow it up a little bit and then pick points inside the bigger space, which aren't in the original space, use those points to fill in the configurations and kind of work with that. So that's kind of the idea here. If we let Y as usual denote Y1 uh, union Y2, if we can embed that space in a larger space Y prime, um, such that we have homeomorphism from Y to Y prime and a retraction from Y prime to Y, if we, um, if we let YJ prime be the um, age of YJ, and if we can find at least n minus one points, which are in the yj prime, but not in the yj, then we get the same lower bound on this relative TC. So just to kind of talk through the, the idea behind the proof here, again, if we, um, well, okay, so the first thing is because we have this homeomorphism, we know that this TC here, like the unprimed spaces is gonna equal the TC of the prime spaces. So that if you have a motion pending algorithm for this TC, you can get a motion planning algorithm for this TC. So then the idea is, again, if we want to move from Y in Y1 to Y prime in Y2, we can look at these configurations where we're filling in the configurations using points which are in uh, like the corresponding Y prime, but not in the original Y. So then the motion planning algorithm that you have over here tells you how to move from this configuration to this configuration, then do the exact same thing, look at the first component of that and project it down to get a, a path in um, so that, that's at that point, then that's going to be a path in Y prime from um, from Y to Y prime. But then you can use this retraction to kind of push that back into a path in in Y. So, like I said, it's kind of a similar idea, but instead of using like the fixed point free maps to fill in the configurations, we're blowing the space up a little bit and then picking points which are outside of the smaller space to fill in the configurations. Okay, so. What I want to talk through for the remainder of the talk is just a couple of examples of specific um, configuration spaces and results related to this relative topological complexity. So the first one is a real simple observation, which is if we have, if it's the case that the inclusions of like the Y1 and the Y2 into Y are both null homotopic, then so are the inclusions of the, um, like the YJ to the nth power into the Y to the nth power. So then based on like the upper bound on this TC, we knew that this TC was less than or equal to this TC, but because these inclusions are null on the topic, the result from earlier says that this TC is equal to zero. So in particular, if you're starting with just a single space Y, which is contractible, then this TC here is going to be zero. And that's like usually going to be quite a bit less than just a TC of a configuration space. And the idea is if you have if you have a contractible space and you're talking about how to move from one configuration to another, 
I mean, the issues are just that you can't have the robots right into each other. But if you allow the robots to move up and down, then you completely avoid those issues. And then this kind of motion planning algorithm is trivial. So that's the first kind of simple example. And then for the next two examples, I'm going to be talking about situations in which the um, this upper bound here, if I go way back, uh, this upper bound here, no, not this one, the other one, this upper bound is sharp in some cases, but not sharp in other cases. So the first one is an example of which, in which uh, that upper bound is sharp. So now uh, this has to do with graph configuration spaces. So if we have a connected graph Y, which has at least um, N disjoint cycles where N is at least two, then this relative TC of the configuration spaces of Y inside of this uh, y, configuration space of Y cross I is equal to TN, which is equal to the uh, TC of Y to the N. So this is an example in which the upper bound is actually sharp. This TC here actually equals this TC. So I'll quickly talk through a sketch of the proof of this. I'm, I'm just going to explain this for N equals two, but you can kind of see how it generalizes for um, higher values of N. But the idea with this is, in, in the proof of kind of one of the earlier results, we mentioned that this TC here is equal to this TC. So what I want to think about is, can we use cohomology to get lower bounds on this TC? So we, the, the cohomological lower bounds are related to the cohomology of Y squared. So roughly speaking, the idea with this is because we have these two just disjoint cycles, we get these kind of four different cohomology classes. So like roughly you have kind of a cohomology class corresponding to doing like the first cycle and kind of the first component and then nothing in the second component. Another one where you're kind of doing nothing in the first component and the second cycle in the second, and then kind of flipping it, you can do like the, the second cycle in the first component, nothing in the second component, and then like nothing in the first component and then the first cycle in the second component. So anyway, the idea with this is that we get these four different cohomology classes and you can see that if you look at like the standard kind of corresponding zero divisors, the product of those is going to be non-zero in, um, in this tensor product. But the thing with this is because these cycles are disjoint, you can think about these cohomology classes as actually being classes in the cohomology of the configuration spaces. So then the idea is if you apply the map induced by the um, inclusions, then the uh, the product of the like the corresponding zero divisors is going to be non-zero in this tensor product. So then the like the cohomological lower bounds tell us that this TC here is at least four, but we also know that it's less than or equal to this, and it's easy to see that this TC is, is equal to four. I mean, you can see that it's less than four or less than or equal to four just by dimensions. So this is one case in which. Um, this TC here actually achieves this upper bound and that it's, it's equal to the TC of Y squared. And actually another thing that I can point out about this is if you just look at the TC of the configuration space here, that's also equal to four. So this is, this is one case where it actually doesn't really help you out too much to allow the robots to move up and down. If you, if you don't allow the robots to move up and down, you get kind of the, TC, the same TC as you do if you do allow them to move up and down. So, Anyway, the point of that is that this is an example in which the, um, the upper bound is actually achieved. And then this next example is an example in which the upper bound is not achieved so that the, the TC of this, this kind of relative TC here is strictly less than the TC of the, uh, the product of the, the underlying space. So in this example, if we have a, a value of N, which is at least two, and then a positive e even integer N or M, excuse me, then this relative TC where we're looking at configurations of N points in the M dimensional sphere. And again, we're allowing the robots to move up and down. That's less than or equal to N plus one, which is tri strictly less than the TC of SM to the N power. And again, I'll just kind of quickly talk through the idea behind the proof here. We can construct a motion planning algorithm for um, SM to the N in kind of the same way that Farber does. So. We can start by just looking at a, at a motion planning algorithm for SM. So we do this, this usual thing where you let one of the open sets be the, uh, the set of all points which aren't antipodal. Then you can like just take the shortest path from X to Y on that set. The second set is all of the uh, points which are antipodal except for some value of Z where um, like we're, we're constructing this, this tangent vector field which is non-zero everywhere except at the point Z. So here, as long as this point here isn't equal to Z, then you can kind of 
take the path from x and negative x like in the direction of the the vector at x and then the last set here is just the second tan of the singleton z negative z and then we can just pick any path that we want from z to negative z so anyway like the idea is that these sets here give us a motion planning algorithm for sm and then you can just kind of put those sets together to get a motion planning algorithm for sm to the n um so I mean that's kind of what it looks like here. The, the main thing is that we're just taking kind of different products of these sets here to get a motion planning algorithm for S M to the N. But the thing with this is because we're dealing with configurations, we don't actually need all of these to cover all of the configurations, right? So the idea is, at most one of the points is going to equal Z. So we actually are only going to need like up to you like we would only potentially need like one of these U threes in this product. So you actually don't need all of these W's to cover the product of the configuration spaces. You only need this many of them. So then that's where this, you kind of get the lower TC and the fact that you don't need as many of the open sets to cover um, the products of these two configuration spaces. You only need two N, or excuse me, N plus two of them, which means that the TC has to be less than N plus, less than or equal to N plus one. Okay. So I think that is a good place to stop. So thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to talk about them. Are there any questions? I have a comment and a question. Sure. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, hi, that was, that was really fun. Thank you. Um, so the comment is when you, um, for your lower bound, you had this condition of the existence of these fixed point free maps. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that what you're really asking for is a section of the Fidel Neuwirth vibration, which takes a configuration of end points and projects onto the first point. So basically, you've got a point in Y or whatever, and you mm -hmm. want to produce a configuration in Y. So, I mean, if you if you say, well, is there a section of this Fidel Neuwirth vibration, maybe you can find more examples of spaces which, which satisfy this. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Sure. No. And then the question was, um, have you thought about the following? So your, your motivating question was, if I include Y into a larger space, mm -hmm. can, can the relative TC... Um, go down or, or something like that. You could also, <clears throat> so talking about sections of Fidel Neuwirth vibrations, suppose you can continuously associate to any configuration of n points, a configuration of n plus one points. So you have some way of adding in an, another disjoint point, then you can include Cn of y into Cn plus one of y and sort of stabilize that way. So you can do this if y is the plane, for example, and then you could ask the same question there. Is that something that you? That's not something that I've, I've considered, but that, I mean, that does sound like an interesting question. So the idea would be like you're, instead of, instead of changing the space Y, you're changing how many points you have. Yeah, I mean, intuitively, it seems like adding an extra point wouldn't make it any easier to plan. Yeah, sure, sure. But that's not clear to me how you would, how you would show that, but. Yeah, I mean, so I mean, I guess that, that's almost like, I don't know, you can almost think about that as kind of, where am I going here, as like filling in, well, let me go back this way. It, it's almost like you'd be sort of filling in the stuff between here and here, because like here you have like a configuration with one point. And you're including that into somehow comparing that to configuration where you have n points. So you can think about then, like maybe between there, you have a configuration with n minus one points and so on. Uh huh. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I've, I haven't thought about that. So I, I don't really have any insight into that. Okay. Thanks. Anything else? Well, if you would unmute your uh, microphones and we can thank Steve for a lovely talk. Thank you.
Okay, so uh, I'm going to stop the recording, but we'll keep the session open. And if anyone has any other questions, then um, you, we can, you can ask.